Good morning, Athey Creek. Let's all stand together. So glad you guys could all make it today. We are going to be taking communion here later in the service, so make sure and grab the communion elements on your way in if you haven't already. And some guys will be carrying those around right now as well. Other than that, we're going to worship the Lord before we get into the Word. So let's sing out together. You are able to provide. You are faithful in perfect time. Your goodness overwhelms I.
thankful we are, Lord, that we can put our trust in you, that Lord, there's nothing that you've lacked. You've never missed a step. You've never failed us or forsaken us. We're just thankful for your trustworthiness. Lord, we confess that we often lean on other things and trust in things that we shouldn't. Um, but Lord, we're so thankful we have something that's solid, that we can look to you and look to your word for guidance, for wisdom. Lord, your word is true and trustworthy as well. It's for that reason, Lord, we wanna open our Bibles with open hearts and open minds just to hear your word and be transformed and changed. Lord, I pray that you'd take even the most skeptical and cynical and Lord, you'd just soften hearts and help them just to know your goodness and your plan of salvation for all of us. Um, so bless this time, use this time for your purpose, Lord. Be glorified in this place, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, Wednesday night, we're gonna continue our Through the Bible study. We left off finishing John chapter four. So if you would, turn with me to John chapter five. And if you're just joining us, we uh, go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, right through the Bible. So we happen to be in John chapter five. So we'll pick it up there where we left off. John chapter five. Are you familiar with the statement, God helps those who help themselves. Um, it's funny because if you're an old school person, you know, like me, yeah, maybe you heard back in the olden days where grandma would say, well, the good book says God helps those who help themselves. Uh, and, and people attributed that to the Bible, which is actually incorrect. Um, uh, it actually is uh, probably the oldest part of this uh, comes from ancient Greece, uh, where they said the gods help those who help themselves. That was kind of their mantra, the gods. Uh, which that we know that's really paganism uh, to say the least. Um, but uh, some of the, uh, after the Greeks, the, the first time the, the phrase God help those who help themselves, um, we, it was also illustrated by two of Aesop's fables uh, of all places. Um, some people get attributed to Benjamin Franklin uh, in 1757 uh, and quoted in Poor Richard's Almanac, uh, God helps those who help themselves. But um, the earliest English language form of this, where a guy literally wrote this down, was in 1698, Algernon Sidney. Um, the modern uh, uh, you know, English version comes in 1698. Um, in a Discourse Concerning Government, he wrote, uh, there's a humorous addition, by the way, to the saying in his, uh, where God helps those who help themselves, but God help those who get caught helping themselves. <laughs> That's what uh, he, this guy added uh, to it. Um, some people for years mistook, this is a biblical saying. Um, and if your grandma said the good book says, uh, then you might have to ask her which good book because there, there's other quote, holy books that uh, actually did say that in so many words. The Quran actually in 1311 uh, um, states, verily a law does not change a people's condition unless they change their inner selves. Uh, which is kind of interesting if you're, uh, if you're familiar with Allah of the uh, uh, Muslim you know, deity there. Um, he's kind of a capricious God. You can't really know what kind of a mood that he's in. And uh, it's not something, it's a little scary if you're a follower of Allah because nobody really knows what he's feeling. Um, the Bible tells us all about our God, uh, that he's compassionate, his mercies never fail. Um, he's gracious and uh, kind-hearted. I'm so thankful. I would not tr trade the Bible for the Quran, not on any day. Um, but when it comes to God helps those who helps themselves, the Bible actually teaches the opposite of that. Now, the Bible teaches that God helps the helpless. Uh, it's illustrated right here in Isaiah 25, verse four, uh, where it says, you have been a defense for the helpless. Uh, Isaiah is speaking to the Lord here. A defense for the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shade from the heat, for the breath of the ruthless is like a rainstorm against a wall. It was great last night during our uh, six o'clock service, uh, as I read this, a rainstorm against the wall, the rain just started pounding and you could hear it outside. It was a nice illustration um, for this scripture. But I love that first line, for you have been a defense for the helpless. Um, the Lord is a defense for the helpless. Um, not only in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, Romans 5, 6, for while we were yet uh, still helpless, uh, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. I like this New American Standard uh, translation of that verse. For while we were still helpless, um, at the right time, Christ died uh, for the ungodly. Now, some of you might be saying, well, Brett, I read the Bible. 
And there is a certain truth that God helps those who help themselves. Maybe, you're, you're probably right about that in the sense that um, uh, God is not into laziness or apathy or just sitting around doing nothing. That's not really a biblical notion. Um, <clears throat> and God will help those who are you know, busy you know, doing the work. Uh, that is something we see. So there's a certain truth to that. But when it comes to salvation, this is the main thing I, I need to stress. When it comes to salvation, we're all helpless. There's nothing you can do to save yourself from your sin and the penalty of sin. This is really important. By the way, have you ever been in a place where you've been truly helpless? Uh, if you're in a place of total helplessness, you, you know, talk about vulnerability. Um, there's not a lot of times in my life I've felt helpless. I, I can think of a handful. I, I remember feeling helpless um, uh, in an earthquake once, Debbie and I were in an earthquake. Uh, we were up on a seventh floor of a hotel room and the, it just started swaying. And uh, it was you know, an earthquake, there's nothing you can do. Uh, well, Brent, you can run to a door jam. Uh, I'm a logical person. If I'm on the seventh floor and the building's going down, the door jam's not gonna do anything for me. Uh, maybe kill me earlier, that'd be great. Uh, but uh, you do kind of feel helpless in an earthquake when you feel the whole earth shaking under you. Um, I felt helpless on the runway in Africa, in Burkina Faso, Ouagadougou, the capital city of Burkina. We were on the runway there years ago and we had our little luggage. I, I wasn't carrying big, I, I travel pretty light. But as we were getting ready to get on the plane to leave, um, these uh, Burkina Faso soldiers came and surrounded us with AK-47s and they had their rifles pointed right at our heads. And we were out there on the runway for 30 minutes with this, uh, these guys were saying, your luggage is too heavy, you owe us money. And we're not gonna let you on the plane until you pay us money. Um, and we said, well, how much do we have to pay you? And the guy said, $700, American dollars. Um, obviously, they weren't agents of Air France, if you know what I mean. Uh, they were just getting money from the guys with the tiny little luggage bags. Um, now, uh, unfortunately, I didn't have any money in, except for maybe 10 bucks. I had like $10. I'm like, I got $10. And they're like, uh, no, you know, $700. Um, fortunately, I had a guy in my group who had $700 on him. He paid them and they let us on the plane after 30 minutes. But I remember feeling somewhat help helpless at the end of an AK-47. Uh, well, we paid them uh, and then Air France refunded my buddy's money back because um, we were in the care of Air France technically from the time they let us out of the airport to walk onto their, their plane. So kind of cool, we got the money back, but helpless. Oh, if you've ever been to that place where you know, man, there's nothing I can do here. We have such a guy in our story in John chapter five. This guy is helpless and he's been helpless for a really long time and you can kind of feel his pain as we start to read his story. Let's take a look. John chapter five, verse one. After this, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep, a market, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue, Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. Now pause right there for a second. So what's this place, Bethesda? Um, interesting, uh, a place where there were pools with five porches in Jerusalem. You'll notice in verse two, now there's a Jerusalem by the sheep, a mark, uh, sheep market, a pool. Um, the word markets in italics, it's not there in the original. Um, most scholars believe he's talking about the sheep gate. In Jesus's time in Jerusalem, the gate was called the sheep gate. If you go there today in Jerusalem, it's the same as the lion gate. They changed the name from sheep gate to lion gate. Lion sounds more impressive than sheep. Why did they call it sheep back in those days? It's because that's where they would bring the sheep to go into the temple. You see the lion gate today or the sheep gate then was close to the temple mount where they would bring the sheep to, to bring for sacrifice there for the uh, uh, priesthood in Jerusalem. During Jesus' time, it was called the Sheep Gate, and it's in the Muslim quarter uh, of Jerusalem. I, last time, one of the recent times we were there, we shot some footage of this, and um, you'll see some Athey Creekers. Um, this is the Lion Gate. Of course, Saladin is the one who built this wall with these lions, uh, and that's when they changed the name to the Lion Gate. Um, but we, uh, we bring our group through here and, and this is either coming or going from the Temple Mount area. And you walk down this little street uh, where the sheep were brought in the city of Jerusalem. Um, and then it brings you to this place called the Pool of Bethesda. 
Um, and when you go there to look at it, it's a little bit of a disappointment. If you're picturing uh, big flowing pools of blue water, that's not what it is. Um, the pool of Bethesda is behind me in this, in this picture right there. That's the pool of Bethesda. And you're like, well, where's the water? There hasn't been water there for centuries. Um, as, you know, some believe that <clears throat> the shifting of the plates and what have you over the centuries diverted all the water down toward the southern part of Jerusalem and there's no longer any water there. But, um, but this was where the pool of Bethesda, now you're saying, Brett, that's just a deep hole uh, in the ground. Well, remember, when you're in Jerusalem, you have to go down 30 feet or 40 feet before you even get to the strata where Jesus was. That's something people forget. Um, but the pool of Bethesda was down. In fact, I'll show you even more. The, um, they, the last time we were there, I took a couple iPhone photos, uh, uh, how far down there, they've dug even deeper since these, this video was shot. Um, I'll show you, here's some pictures from my iPhone. Um, the, the picture on the left there, they're, they're still digging and they're finding all kinds of artifacts and what have you from the first century. And I put that other picture there because I wanted to embarrass Randy and Fran. I like those guys, they're a couple that were on our tour. Uh, nice couple. Uh, <laughs> but all that to say, uh, just a, a great uh, place to visit if you're in Jerusalem. Now in all the archeological digs that these guys have done, they've also found a hint of paganism. These pools uh, were known for being a place um, uh, where the Greco-Roman god um, uh, Scepolus uh, was uh, worshipped, um, Asclep Asclepius, I should say, is, his, is the name for him. And he was this god that was uh, sort of the, supposed to be the god of healing and of medicine. Now, you'll notice something about um, Asclepius that is interesting. He's got a, a wooden pole with a snake wrapped around it. Does that ring a bell? Um, they robbed that. They stole that idea from Exodus, uh, the story uh, of the children of Israel wandering, Numbers 21, that whole story of the red serpents and all that. But um, I wanted you to see that because it, it's sort of a ripoff. Um, but but they, th there, was, there was a legend that started to go around that this pool was a place of healing, so they would worship um, Asclepius at this place. Now, um, what's kind of fun also is if you're, if you're there, uh, there's a, they built a, a church right next to this pool of Bethesda, the archaeological ruins. Um, and I'll just show you a quick snippet of that. St. Anne's, which is kind of cool, is built in 1131. So we go in there and sing some songs. Uh, it's, you know, it's a, a thousand year old church is kind of fun to visit. And so we go in there and sing and your, your voices echo for like 20 seconds. If you clap your hands, you hear the echo for like 20 seconds. Uh, maybe you can hear it. This doesn't do it justice, um, but it is kind of a cool old uh, place to sing and worship the Lord. Um, and so we always go to this place, the Pool of Bethesda, with this uh, 1100 or, uh, or thousand year old church that's there. Now you say, okay, Brett, so we got the Pool of Bethesda. Um, what's the big deal in this place? Why is it so it doesn't look like a pool? Um, as it turns out, um, there were, because of the, the, um, the, Christian history that was there with Jesus and what we're about to read in John 5, um, the Byzantine era, they built a basilica over the pool of Bethesda. And so some of this you're seeing are the ruins of the basilica that they built over the pool. Also during the Crusader era, they built a, um, a chapel that was also built over the central wall. So what you're seeing behind me in this picture and stuff, um, this is actually the ruins of all the things they built over the pool of Bethesda. So it's a little confusing when you go and try to see the site. Um, what did they use this pool for? Nobody really knows. Some say it's where they washed the sheep. The only problem is the pool was 30 feet deep and that's not an easy way to wash sheep. Um, most scholars, if you go to like biblical archeological review, they say this pool was used as a mikvah, which is the Jewish ritual bath. So the Jews would come and wash there ceremonially. Um, that's kind of the tradition there. But as it turns out here in our text of John 5, it tells us another thing about the pool of Bethesda. Um, if we read on in verse four, it says, for an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, uh, after the troubling of the water stepped in, was made whole of whatever disease he had. Now, some of you are looking at me confused right now, and I, I understand because you don't have a verse four. You're like, what? 
There's no verse four in my Bible. Where, where, where were you reading that? Um, you have a missing verse. How many of you guys are missing verse four in your Bible right now? See, you guys need to throw away those Bibles. No, I'm just kidding. No, that's not even funny. Not even funny. Um, why do you not have a verse four? Well, it's really a simple answer. And, and I'm glad this is an opportunity to remind you, you and I, whether you're reading the King Jimmy or the ESV or the NIV, we're all reading translations from the original Greek language. Do you understand that? That's important. And if you're wondering, Brett, are you suggesting that there's mistakes in the Bible? Um, not if you're reading from the Greek original text, no. Um, but here's the question, which Greek text are you reading? And there's actually different. There's the good thing, the good news is the Bible uh, has more manuscript evidence than any other writing in the history of the world. Hundreds and hundreds of manuscripts that we have that are translated. Um, the question is, which of the manuscripts did your translator use? The NIV people used a different one than the King James people. Um, one group uses Masoretic text, uh, others use the Textus Receptus. Um, there's all different kinds of texts. It becomes a very esoteric discussion. But the reason you don't have a verse four in your Bible, if, you, if you're like ESV or NIV or some of the newer translations, no extant Greek manuscript before 400 AD contains verse four. The earliest manuscripts don't have the verse four there. So some scholars suggest it was added later by translators uh, or people that were copying manuscripts for points of clarity. Why is this dude sitting next to this pool at Bethesda? They sort of seek to give an answer. So there is debate, should verse four be included in the canon of scripture or should it not be? And so that's a debatable thing. Now, you might say, well, I'm shaken to the core. I don't know if I should read the Bible anymore because there's, there's uh, unclear. Here's the good news. There's several places in your Bibles where there's disagreements on which verses should be included, um, which manuscripts and all that stuff. Um, the good news is there's no verse that actually hurts or bothers doctrine one tiny little bit. Um, the pool of Bethesda, whether there was an angel that went and stirred the water or not, is not gonna change anything about our doctrine. And I'll even show you how that works out and what that means. So uh, verse four, by the way, it's also missing half of verse three, if you're noticing. I read in verse three, uh, you know, there's impotent, blind, halt, wither, and it says waiting for the moving of the water. That last phrase is also left out of the newer translations. So don't let that bother you. Just because we teach from the King James Bible, um, I have my King James only people. Yeah, Pastor Rick, you're King James only, right? Uh, I'm not. I love the ESV. Uh, well, then why don't you use it? Well, I love the King James. I think the King James is a great translation. It's been proven for hundreds of years, all the way since 1611. I love it. I like the poetic value of the King James. It slows me down. It kind of makes me uh, give a sort of reverence to the Bible and its poetic value. I love all that. So it's tough to teach an old dog new tricks. I'm gonna, I'll use the King James probably till I die. But if you force me to change, I'd probably go to like the ESV. I love the ESV. Uh, it's a great translation of the Bible. So don't let that shake you or freak you out. But, um, but then the question is, this verse four, the controversial verse, what are we supposed to think about this? There's this pool and an angel comes and stirs the water and the, the first one in gets healed, the last one in is a rotten egg. Like what's up with that? Uh, I don't get it. Well, as it turns out, um, uh, nobody really agrees on whether this pool, if the Bible is trying to tell us here in the King James, uh, was it something that was the Lord's doing? See, some people say, yeah, the Lord caused an angel to stir the water every so often, once or twice a year, and the people would plop in and get healed. I'm a little skeptical of that one, and I'll tell you why. Um, it sounds a little bit of a bummer, and when we hear the narrative of this story, people, like, they fight to get into the water, and the first one in gets healed. Uh, everybody else is bummed, and it's, it's, it's sort of strife and contention. Does that really sound like what the Lord would do? Just let it one person healed every so often. I'm sure there's people that like to think that's who God is, but as it turns out, we'll see a different uh, narrative in this story. So I'm a little uh, hesitant to just believe this is actually what was happening. So the first theory is it's literally a dispensation of the Lord, the healing waters of Bethesda. The second one is the one I probably lean toward, that it was a legend or the myth goes. It's like the Bible saying the myth was, um, that in the, there was a bunch of people laying around the pool because they believed that they were healing waters. And it would also line up with the worship of Asclepius, which I was just talking about, the guy with the snake on the pole. 
And so it was more of a legend and a myth that you'd be healed by the healing waters because they worshiped the pagan deity um, Asclepius, uh, which, which I, don't, I, I don't believe in that, but some people obviously did. And the Bible might be pointing that out, that it was just a legend, a myth that people believed. A third one that I've heard some suggest, and there's even some uh, hints of this in the, in the text, in the original Greek, that the stirring of the water was an angel, it just wasn't a good angel, it was a fallen angel. Um, that it's actually more of a magic trip, trick of the evil, like Janus and Jambres did magic in Egypt with Moses, the, the servants of Pharaoh. In the same way, this place was sort of a, a poser thing that was, uh, you know, the stirring of the water and all this stuff. So uh, you say, Brett, which one is it? One, two, or three? The answer, don't know. Well, a lot of good you are, Pastor Brett. Um, but here's what I do know. Let me tell you what I do know. There's still a lot of people in this world that are hurting, sick, blind, lame, and, and uh, need healing. And the answer will never be found in the pool of Bethesda. Uh, look at it. There's no water in there right now. Where do people need to find the answer to their problems? Hello? 10 o'clock, are you awake? Did you get your coffee? Where do we go when you have problems? Jesus is always the answer. I love the old Andrew Crouch song. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him, there's no other. Jesus is the way. The guy in our story is gonna make the mistake of really wanting the pool of Bethesda to work for him, but it's not going to. It's gonna have failed him for 38 years and Jesus is gonna be the answer. I think that's the point of the story. So whether you have verse four or not, it doesn't matter. The story still points us to the right answer and that is Jesus Christ. Okay, so let's keep going. Verse five, it says, and a certain man was there which had an infirmity 30 and eight years. Man, have you ever had a cold that just goes on and on? You're like two, three weeks into it. And you're like, what in the world? This has been forever I've had this cold. Um, you know, this guy's been sick for 38 years. Do you realize? Some of you aren't even that old. You don't even know what 38 years means, some of you in this room. Uh, that's a long time to be sick. If you're an old timer in here, you know 38 years is a long time. Ronald Reagan was the president of the United States 38 years ago. The space shuttle Challenger blew up 38 years ago. Uh, Oprah Winfrey did her first network television uh, uh, national uh, show 38 years ago. Um, you know, like, like uh, Michael Jordan shot 63 points in a, a playoff game, uh, most points ever. And, and maybe if you're old enough to remember all those things, uh, that was 38. Can you imagine being uh, lame and crippled for 38 years because of some sickness, disease that you had? Like, this is really a bummer for this poor guy but then you have the compassionate Jesus come onto the scene, verse six. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, wilt thou be made whole? Now, some of you might be thinking, what kind of question is that? Uh, this guy's crippled and diseased and sick somehow. Um, and he's been waiting to go into the water and Jesus comes up and asks, um, you know, now there are stupid questions, by the way. I, I, I disagree with your elementary school teacher that said, there are no st st stupid questions. There are stupid questions. <laughs> Just gonna say that, go on record. But this is not one of them. I'll tell you why. First of all, Jesus says this kind of question a lot to people that are, need to be healed. Um, he goes up to a blind guy, what can I do for you? Uh, hello, he's blind. Why would Jesus go up and ask him that? I think that Jesus often wants people to just ask. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. Jesus gives people an opportunity to ask and to articulate their need. And in our stubborn human nature, we don't wanna do that. Uh, we don't wanna acknowledge our need or, or even admit what we need. Um, but Jesus gives this guy, um, and he asks the simple question, will thou be made whole? Now, the obvious answer, you, you know, anybody with half a brain, when, when Jesus is standing in front of you, you should probably say, yes. Wouldn't you agree? Just say yes. If Jesus is saying, will you be made whole? Just say yes. But this guy doesn't say yes. What does this guy say? Verse seven, the impotent man answered him, sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Um, this poor guy, you know, he, he, it's a wrestling match to try to get to the water in time, but the healthier people get in the pool before him. Interesting. Verse eight, Jesus said to him, rise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole 
and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Uh Uh-oh, Jesus just healed a guy on the Sabbath. That'll come into play here in a minute. But he heals the guy. Let's just bask in the glory of that for a minute. And what did this guy do thus far to be worthy of healing? Anybody? He did nothing. He just sat there. And he, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paint this guy. Now, I used to, as a younger guy, be more compassionate to this guy, and I probably still should be, but I'm not. What do you mean, Brett? Well, this guy, I, I think he's kind of a stinker. What do you mean, Brett? Now, before you get mad at me for calling a paralyzed guy a stinker, um, we're all stinkers. We're all kind of messed up. But can I already reveal some of the things this guy does? First of all, um, he sits there when Jesus says, will you be made whole? And he doesn't say yes. He's stuck on his dumb um, plan uh, that's stuck to this tradition or this thing of the pool of Bethesda. It was sort of a gimmick, you know. Uh, I have no man, he says, to throw me into the, the pool when the water is stirred. That's a, that's a bad answer. He shouldn't have said that. Uh, he was still clinging to his plan to go into the pool of Bethesda and be healed when Jesus, the ultimate salvation that he ever needed, was standing right in front of him. Do people miss Jesus because they're so busy clinging to their little, you know, homemade recipe of how to heal themselves or, or their little gimmick? Um, I, I, I'm always amazed what people will believe as far as uh, what you'll buy and things people will purchase, um, the shopping network and stuff. Um, one of the pinnacles of stupidity, if you ask me. Do you remember, if you're old enough, you're back in the, I think it was late 80s, early 90s, when they had the abdominizer, whatever it was. It was like, you, you'd buy it, and they showed this guy with a six-pack, you know. And, and, and he had these little electrodes stuck to his, his, his ab, abdominum, you know, abdominal you know, passage area, and, and it'd shock him, and you'd see his muscles flex. You're like, I'm gonna buy that. And so people with these, you know, with your ab, uh, they would hook your little electrodes to your ab, and you'd be walking around with a six-pack in no time at all. People, millions of people bought these things. Now, don't admit if you, I, I should have a show of hands. How many of you guys, no, don't, don't do that. Um, well, uh, you know, people buy stuff and gimmicky stuff, and especially when it comes to health, especially when it comes, you know, um, to uh, getting wealth quickly. It's amazing what people will do. Uh, we're just a gullible bunch of people. This guy's into his little gimmicky, if I could just get in the water, I have no man. Meanwhile, Jesus is saying, will you be made whole? And sometimes I wonder if people don't want to be made whole. Sometimes I think people are almost afraid of being, it's a little bit like, you know, have you ever um, met a, a person who's done hard time in prison and they don't want to get out because of the unknown on the outside? Have you ever met a sinner who doesn't want to let go of their sins, even though they know it's bad, but for some reason they're kind of clinging and they don't want to let go? Um, it's like, it reminds me of Pharaoh. Do you remember in Egypt, the frogs, the plague of frogs and the whole area began to stink with frogs, the Bible says. And finally the Egyptians said, Pharaoh, we gotta get rid of these frogs. If they stink and they're piled up, they squish between your toes when you walk around. So what they did is they said, get Moses. So Moses comes in and says, okay, Pharaoh, what's up? He says, I'll let the people go. Just get rid of these frogs. And Moses asks a Jesus-esque question here. He says, Pharaoh, when would you like me to have the frogs removed? Um, I would call that a dumb question. Until you hear Pharaoh's answer. He said, does anybody remember his answer? Tomorrow. It seems that Pharaoh wanted one more night with the frogs. <laughs> Some of you are like that. You, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll quit my drug addiction tomorrow. Um, you know, I can quit uh, drinking alcohol at any moment. I can, I can quit any time tomorrow. Why procrastinate today when you can procrastinate tomorrow? Um, that's that's the, what Pharaoh does. That's just human nature. So this guy just says, you know, will you be made whole? And all he has to do is say yes. But, but what good thing did this guy do? So far, nothing, but it's gonna get worse. Um, does this guy deserve help from Jesus? Um, I think I'm gonna show you where he doesn't deserve it. Um, but, um, but this man has some other issues that we're gonna find out as we keep going here. So um, Jesus heals the guy on the Sabbath. So verse 10, it picks up. The Jews therefore said unto him, that was cured. It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. Oh no. Do you see the religious wackoness here? 
These guys are like, so yeah, dude, you've been laying here crippled for 38 years and some guy healed you, but what, for whatever you do, don't carry your bed because it's the Sabbath day. That's so dumb. The lunacy of legalism and religiosity, it just gets weirder and weirder. But um, we'll get into that more as we read on because there's gonna be more of that uh, weirdness. Uh, verse 11, when they said, it's not lawful to carry your bed. Well, the, the guy that was crippled said in verse 11, he answered them, he that made me whole, the same said unto me, take up thy bed and walk. Then asked they him, what man is that which said unto thee, take up thy bed and walk? Who, who did this? Verse 13, and he that was healed wist not who it was. That's just the King James way of saying he had no clue who healed him. That's interesting that he had no clue who healed him. But it says he wist not um, who it was for Jesus had conveyed himself away a multitude being in that place. The idea of Jesus conveying himself away is he knew that because of the healing of this guy, there was gonna be controversy because he healed him on the Sabbath. So Jesus kind of gets out of Dodge or Jerusalem as it were. He kind of conveys himself. Now, what does that look like? I don't know. Did he sort of beam me up Scotty kind of convey? Uh, or did he just kind of work through the multitude of the crowd? I don't know, but they couldn't find him because Jesus wasn't gonna mess with these guys at this moment. But the guy, interesting, he's healed, but he doesn't even know who healed him. Um, I wonder how many people have been helped by God, but they don't give God credit. The reason this is noticeable, if you, if you compare and contrast some of the other healings that Jesus did, what was a normal response when somebody was healed by Jesus in the typical stories of the gospels? Jesus would heal them and then what? Anything, anybody? They'd fall down and worship him. What else? Go and tell people. Jesus gave them assignments and stuff. This guy was just walked away. Didn't even get an assignment. And, and not only that, this guy, you know, was one guy, remember the demon possessed guy? Oh, let me just follow you like one of your disciples. Like there's so many good responses of people that were healed by Jesus. This guy picks up his bed and starts walking and he doesn't look back and he doesn't even know who it was that healed him. So when it comes time to identify him, he's like, I don't know who the guy was. Um, I wanna point out there's a little bit of apathy and sort of a nonchalant kind of attitude toward Jesus. Um, but we'll see even more of that as we keep going here. So, um, so Jesus kind of was away, but then something kind of happens that's shocking. Jesus finds the dude again in verse 14. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more lest a worse thing come unto thee. Uh, now this is interesting, isn't it? Uh, Jesus wasn't done with this guy, even though the guy was done with Jesus. He got healed, so pure, he's out of there, gone. And then they come, who, did, who healed him? I don't know, who cares, whatever. And so Jesus hunts this guy down and finds him because he's got more to do. Almost always, did you notice when Jesus heals sick people, he's got more work to do than just healing them of sickness. Remember the woman that had the issue of blood? She touched his garment and she was healed, but Jesus wasn't done with her because he, he healed her, but he hadn't made her, anybody remember? Whole. There's a wholeness <clears throat> that Jesus wants for these people, not just being healed. This guy didn't just have a sickness problem, he had a sin problem. And so Jesus wasn't done with them. And he uses words like, remember the woman that was caught in adultery and she was thrown down probably naked in front of all the guys in the street? And the guys, the Pharisees said, Jesus, Moses said we should stone her to death because she was caught in the act of adultery. What do you say? And they were saying this to get Jesus into trouble. But Jesus brilliantly looked at those guys and said, those of you that were without sin, cast the first stone. And one by one, as Jesus was riding on the ground, um, something in the sand, one by one, they dropped the rocks and left. And then the woman's there by herself. And Jesus said, where are your accusers? No man condemns me. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go your way and what? Sin no more. Did he say, sin no more or else you're gonna get it? Is that what he said? No. If you know Jesus and you follow his ministry, he was being gracious. Go your way. It's almost like he's saying, you don't have to sin anymore. You're free to not sin. This guy gets a little similar word, but with a little more of a pointed end. Did you notice that? This guy gets the sin no more in verse 14, but Jesus says, lest a worse thing come unto thee. You thought it was bad before for 38 years, the sickness you were dealing with? Sin no more, lest something worse comes upon you. 
This is where scholars wonder if the guy 38 years ago did something, probably some kind of sexually transmitted disease that contributed to his crippled state. So Jesus heals them and says, dude, don't just go off and keep sinning because worse stuff's gonna come upon you. Some people think this is Jesus saying, I'll punish you with sin, uh, you know, with, with uh, repercussions of your sin. Question, does God punish you if you're a Christian or a believer for your sins? I hear people say this all the time. I think the Lord's punishing me for my sins. And I always like to say, are, are you burning in hell for all of eternity? Because that's what, that's what, what is the punishment for sin? Well, the book of Romans reminds us very clearly for the wages of sin is death. And we're talking eternal death in hell. So if you think you're being punished for your sins, the answer is no, you are not because you're not burning in hell, at least not last time I checked, for all eternity. Um, by the way, the second part of this verse is beautiful. The wages of sin is, is death, that's what it costs. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So this guy, Jesus isn't saying, you better not sin or else I'm gonna punish you worse than before. That's not what he's saying. Jesus is simply stating sin. There's a repercussion to your sin. When you and I sin, um, it's gonna hurt you. If the Bible calls it sin, it's gonna mess you up whether you like it or not. Um, you know, it's, it's just like a three-year-old wanting to touch the red hot stove. As a parent, you run and you chase them. Why are two and a half to three-year-olds always drawn to the most dangerous thing in the room. Have you ever noticed that? Little kids, man, they'll find the electrical outlet. I wonder what happens if I stick my tongue in the electrical outlet. It's like, why? What, what came in your brain to think that that was a good idea? It's shocking. <laughs> the three-year-old. And yet, it's not just three-year-olds, it's 30-year-olds. Because we do the same thing. We're drawn to sinful things and we try to make excuses for sinful stuff. And when the Bible calls something sin, sin is not you know, bad because it's forbidden. It's forbidden because it's bad. Sin is bad, it messes you up and God loves you and he doesn't want you to get messed up. You can be like the three-year-old um, you know, uh, if, if like for example, you know, the homosexual community says, we're just gonna do it, it's who we are, we were born that way, and we don't care what the Bible says about that. Uh, and they rip out pages of the Bible that they don't like when it calls homosexuality, for example, of an abomination. Um, there's other sins we could talk about, but that's the one that a lot of people are saying, yeah, whatever, we don't believe the Bible on this one. Um, there's other sins. Some people say, Brett, you're wrong. Um, I, I was born that way, I was born homosexual. I had no choice, it's not a lifestyle choice, it's who I am. Um, if I give you that argument, can I just tell you, there's a bunch of men in this room that were born angry, that we have angry men. Should we celebrate that? Let's have a pride march of angry men marching down. Oh, that's Antifa. Anyway, um, <laughs> never mind, just, just kidding. There, there, there's people that are just angry, they were born that way. We don't celebrate that, we try to subdue that. That's true with all of our sins. And it's not just the homosexual who's a sinner, it's all of us. I'm a sinner and we're all sinners. Um, but what makes sin bad? Well, the fact that God calls it sin, that's not really, I think, what makes it bad, although it sort of does that too. But the reason God calls sin bad is because he loves you. It's just like the three-year-old, the parent, that won't let them touch the red-hot stove. The kid might think, what a jerk my parents are, not letting me touch the beautiful, red, colorful thing. But you know, the parent knows best in the same way God knows what's best. And the world rebels against that. And then we wonder why we're miserable, why we're suicidal, why we're diseased and sick and in trouble. We scratch our heads wondering, well, we're doing what we wanna do. Why are we all messed up? Simple answer, just what Jesus tells this guy. He says, listen, stop sin, sinning, sin no more, lest worse things come upon you. It's not Jesus pronouncing curse upon that guy. It's sin pronounces a curse on that guy. That's why Numbers you know, uh, 32, 23 says, be sure of this, your sin will find you out. Not God will find you out. He already knows what you've done, um, but your sin catches up with you. Well, this guy's gonna have to learn this lesson, um, which is really important part of this thing. So we've got the repercussions of sin uh, uh, that, that Jesus is warning this guy. And now the, le the, the lunacy of the legalism gets even worse. Check it out. So after Jesus said that, verse 15, the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. Does, do you get a sense, 
maybe I'm reading into this, but so far I'm, I'm, I'm still gonna stand my ground. This, this, this guy, compared to other people that got healed by Jesus, this guy's a stinker. He finally learns the name of Jesus and I'm pretty sure he knows uh, by this time the religious guys wanna do him in. And so, he, oh, his name is Jesus? So he runs and tells those guys like a total narc, tattletale dude. He goes, uh, Jesus, it's his name is Jesus. I just found out his name. And then he goes and tells them, I, I'm suspicious of this guy. Um, what good thing did he do? Nothing so far. Well, there is something I'll tell you in a second, but kind of nothing. Um, so he tells them, and then verse 16, and therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. Yeah, there's a capital offense, punishable offense. Uh, Jesus helped a poor crippled guy for 38 years crippled and he, he heals them. And now they wanna kill Jesus for that. Does that make logical sense? The lunacy of religious legalism, be careful with that. You know, these guys had their own dumb rules around the Sabbath day. They weren't biblical. The law of Moses simply states, remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Those guys added a bunch of dumb rules that were man-made, not God-made, just man's religious rules to say, okay, we're gonna keep the Sabbath day holy. So that means if you're carrying your false teeth in your mouth, you're doing work on the Sabbath, so you can't wear your false teeth on the Sabbath day. Dumb. Guess you gotta have soup on the Sabbath. Um, it got weirder and weirder. One of the funny ones, uh, did you know that if you were eating um, radishes, which I don't recommend, <laughs> but if you are eating radishes, if you're a Jew, according to the Jewish traditions, you're not supposed to put salt on your radish. Does anybody know why? The reason why is, did you know that they use salt to uh, pickle radishes? And if you put salt on, and if it's on long enough, the, the pickling process begins. So the Jews stated you can't have salt on your radishes uh, on the Sabbath day because you're doing the work of pickling radishes. Dumb. Uh, we've done whole studies on the laws of man, traditions of man versus what the Bible actually told the people. Um, Jesus had to come and straighten out the Sabbath. Man was not made for the Sabbath. Sabbath was made for man. You guys got it all backwards. But these guys were so crazy. They said, you healed somebody on the Sabbath, so you're worth, that's worthy of death. They were just totally whacked. Can I just remind you and me to be really careful to not put our religious legalistic trips on people that are not biblical? Make sure that if you're standing your ground on something, make sure that what you're standing your ground on is biblical. And there is a place to be made uh, for, for you know, standing firm in what is true and what is false in the Bible. Um, but there's a lot of things that get a little weird and even some are kind of borderline sketchy. Um, like, like for example, J. Vernon McGee, the, the preacher, he's been in heaven now for a long time, but uh, still spookily on the radio every single day, preaching through the Bible. Dearly beloved, I love that guy, J. Vernon McGee. But um, he tells the story uh, back in the 1950s when he, he was a pastor in Texas and he was surprised because they had certain religious things that he was kind of unfamiliar with. For example, after church, he would dismiss everybody. And then he'd go back to the back door and shake everybody's hand. And they'd go, the whole church would go out and light up their cigarettes and just puff away out there. Nobody thought twice about that. Um, you could smoke till the cows come home there at that church in, in Texas. But he learned if you had a church family camp or picnic or whatever, whatever you do, there can't be any mixed bathing. What's that? If you're old enough, maybe you remember this, but it was forbidden for men and women to swim at the same time. There was a time for women to swim, and there was a time for men to swim. And same with children's kids camps and stuff. The girls had a swim time, and whatever you do, you can't commit the unpardonable swim uh, uh, and, and, and get girls and boys in the pool at the same time. That was the Texas way. But then he moved to Southern California and was pastoring a church there. And he said, man, it was totally opposite. When he said he got to California, he said there was, you know, if, if you lit up a cigarette after church, you were going straight to hell. You better get used to the smell of smoke because you're going to hell if you light the devil sticks and you smoke them. And the, and the people there thought that the, that was the unpardonable sin, smoking cigarettes, um, which it actually turns out that it's not. But one thing they were doing in California is mixed bathing, uh, not only mixed bathing, but bikinis. And uh, like California could care less about uh, the whole swimming and mixed swimming thing. It's like, and, and he's like, where did all these people get all these dumb rules? They, they actually all came from just human stuff. The Bible does not say thou shalt not swim at the same time of girls and boys. Um, Brett, does it say thou shalt not uh, smoke cigarettes? Doesn't say that. Are you arguing for, no, you can smoke cigarettes all you want. 
Um, you know, your lungs will look like a barbecue, uh, you know, if you, if you want to do that. Uh, but uh, you're not going to hell for smoking cigarettes. And by the way, if you're standing on the cigarette thing like that, you also better not go to McDonald's and have a quarter pounder because they're equally going to kill you as a cigarette. Uh, trust me, I know. Um, <laughs> Is it sin? Well, we can make arguments and all that stuff. But uh, people get into their little legalistic world and that's not a helpful thing. And that's actually what's happening. Stick with the Bible, stick with stuff we know, and then we'll be on a much better ground. Well, uh, all that to say, um, the one thing I'm gonna give this guy is that he did one thing good and that is this. When Jesus told him to take up his bed and walk, he didn't say, I can't do that. Are you kidding? I've been crippled. I've been laying here for 38 years and you're telling me just to stand up and take up my bed. He doesn't do that. He actually just stands up, takes his bed and starts walking. I got to give him credit. He, he, he took the invitation Jesus gave him and he did it. And that's the only thing that saves him. The only thing that helps him. Jesus is the answer that he needed. For this guy to be made whole, though, was not just the, sin, the, the sickness problem, but he also had to be reminded, now go and sin no more, lest your, this comes back worse than it was before. So Jesus wanted to do more work with them. And, and, and even with that, he goes and tattletales on Jesus to the religious guys. And you say, okay, Brett, that's, that's great. Um, but this guy is a little bit of a stinker in that he never gives Jesus credit. We never see him go thank you or fall down and worship Jesus. He, he just kind of rolls along sort of unappreciative and still sort of being a little bit of a weirdo. And, and you say, why would Jesus um, save a guy like that or care a guy, for a guy like that? The answer I think is reminded in the name of the place that we're talking about today. The pool of Bethesda. What does Bethesda mean? Well, if you look it up in the Hebrew, the word Bethesda means house of grace. House of grace. You see, you and I are the unappreciative crippled person. We're the ones that don't always want to be helped even though we think we have a way to help. And we get our little magical uh, gimmicks that we think are gonna help us be successful or healthy or wealthy or wise. And we keep tapping into that. Meanwhile, Jesus is like, do you wanna be made whole? And instead of saying, yes, Lord, we say, but I don't have a job. I don't have a car. I don't have a boss. I don't have, an, I don't have a man to help me. Uh, nobody cares about me. Wowzy, wowzy, woo, woo, woe is me. <laughs> That's this guy. He's sort of a whining, crippled guy. But it, he's just kind of this dude that doesn't deserve anything. But that's the point. Pool of Bethesda. Bethesda, house of grace. And Jesus is just gracious to this guy. That's why we sing the song, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like the crippled guy that saved a wretch like me. We're the ones who are in need of the grace of God. So I love the name Bethesda because it reminds us why Jesus chooses this guy that seems unappreciative, doesn't say the right thing. Jesus said, will you be made whole? I don't have a man. See, some of you, you're struggling in your marriage right now. And you're like, um, well, well has, have you sought the Lord for help? Oh, you mean pray? Should we pray? Seek the Lord and pray? Like you guys are like, yes, pray. And do what the Bible tells you to do. Just be obedient to God's word. And, and man, um, Jesus is the word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We've been through this in John chapter one. So Jesus is still your answer for your marriage. The question is, will you be made whole? Or you can sit around for your gimmick. What do you mean? You can have a horrible marriage and sit around and go, well, you know, we're, we're waiting for, we don't have a man except for maybe Dr. Phil. He told us how to be married and do better. And, and you, can, you can try to do the little gimmicky thing if you want. Or you can tap into the power of Jesus Christ who has the authority and the power to heal and fix. Um, the, what does the Bible say about marriage? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. There's, there's something for you to do. Are you gonna take up your bed and walk with that? Or are you gonna sit around moaning about you don't have Dr. Phil helping you in your marriage? You see, that's the temptation, is to sit around, for, wait for the gimmick or something that's flashy or you think's gonna help. Meanwhile, Jesus is saying, will you be made whole? It's a good question to ask ourselves. If you're a non-believer, if you're not a Christian, you've yet to see that the Lord Jesus Christ is able to heal you and bless you. 
A lot of us as Christians, we're not perfect. We're not even close. But man, the Lord sure has helped us a lot. And we're on our way to being forgiven, saved, and ultimately end up in heaven because of Jesus, because of his grace. It's by grace that we're saved um, through faith, not of your works, not of yourselves. It's a gift. Just like Jesus gave this guy, the man at the pool of Bethesda, the guy that was totally helpless and God helped those who could not help themselves. This guy was a helpless weirdo. But Jesus says, yeah, but I kind of love that guy and I'm gonna be compassionate toward that guy. Just like he will be for me and just like he will be and has been for you. May the Lord give us ears to hear and learn from the man at the pool of Bethesda. I'd like to finish this with a few minutes we have left to uh, reflect. Lord, are there gimmicks that we're hanging on to? Are there sins that we uh, have forgotten? Would, would Jesus come to us and say the same thing he said to the man at the pool? Would he say, go and sin no more, Athey Creeker, lest the stuff you're doing make, gets worse than what it was before? And Jesus wants to heal you from that. If you would take out those little communion packs, if you didn't get one, there'll be some guys that'll come up right now and make sure you get set up with it. But uh, take those out. You can pull the bottom, turn it over and turn the bottom part open and you get to the little piece of matzo bread. And then you open up the top part and get ready to, uh, to uh, drink of the cup here. And um, let's just prepare our hearts for remembering what Jesus did for us. Lord, how thankful we are for the forgiveness of sin. Like you told this guy to go his way and sin no more, but with that caveat to be careful not to just keep sinning, lest a worse thing come upon him. Lord, we know that sin is bad because it messes us up and hurts us. Forgive us where we've not taken your word seriously and we've been rebellious, doing our own thing, going our own way, coming up with our own set of morality rules. But I pray that we'd let your word just guide us and direct what we do and what we don't do. Forgive us, Lord. And we take time to remember, even as you taught us, um, would you check our hearts like the psalmist, search our heart, see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Holy fire, burn away my desire for anything that is not of you but is of me I want more of you and less of me sing that again with me holy fire burn away my desire for anything that is not of you, but is of me. I want more of you and less of me. Empty me. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be emptied of our sins. Empty us of the things that are our prideful, arrogant opinions that are contrary to your ways. As we take this bread in our hands, we're reminded of the penalty you took, that we are the ones that deserve death and hell and punishment for eternity. But because Jesus went and died on the cross in our place, we're thankful. Nails in hands, nails in feet, crown of thorns, whipping on your back, you took that penalty for us. So we do this, even as you commanded to do this often in remembrance of you, we take time to remember the cross and Jesus's body that was brutalized on our behalf. So we eat this bread now with thanksgiving in Jesus' name and let's eat of the bread of Christ together. In your eyes, in your eyes, I've found grace. In your eyes, sing that with me really simply.
simple. In your eyes, in your eyes, I found Lord, how thankful we are for the cup before us. And I pray that as we drink this, Lord, we'd be reminded of our great salvation you've given to us, saved by grace through faith, just like the the man at the pool of Bethesda. We're thankful. We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. But we know our forgiveness comes by the shedding of innocent blood of your son on the cross. So as we drink this cup, would you wash us clean of our sins, blot them out, remember them no more, I pray that we'd have a new start on this Sunday morning as we leave this sanctuary on this sunny day. I pray, Lord, that you'd cause us to to have a heart to go and sin no more. So we drink deeply now and we celebrate Jesus together. In Jesus' name, let's all drink of Christ together. all who are thirsty and all who are weak just come to the fountain dip your heart in the streams of life let the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the waves of his mercy as deep cries out to deep let's all stand together come lord jesus come come Lord, I pray that you just be filling our lives full of you, more of you, less of us. Like John the Baptist, may you increase and we decrease. Lord, bless these, your people, as we go. Um, Thank you for the good text that was before us this morning. May we live that out and learn from it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.